Does anyone here on Monday uh, hear my presentation? So most of you have heard uh, the story uh, already. Uh, for me, this is a pretty straightforward uh, problem set. And I talked about this very briefly on Monday. Uh, before the first aircraft went into the building, none of us thought about aircrafts flying into buildings. I suspect there's someone in, uh, who's been in the counterterrorism world that probably uh, did think about that. Uh, well, I've never been accused of not talking loud enough before. <laughs> this is new. I, I, I can really start using the, the Marine Corps voice and start booming, but now this is good. So anyway, um, none of us was thinking about uh, an airplane flying into the building. We all thought about an airplane being hijacked and it will land somewhere, we negotiate with stormed airplane, uh, the hostages might be res rescued, uh, maybe not. Uh, so for me, the challenge is the question that uh, Professor Azani has asked. If we believe what we've read, and if we believe what we've seen from uh, terrorist organizations, that they understand the challenges, uh, they understand the, the, uh, our reliance on our internet, why haven't they done something about that? Why haven't they taken offensive operations? Uh, and again, the whole series of questions, are they not technically capable? I, I doubt that because it really, it doesn't take an awful lot of technology to be disruptive in this space. And if you go out there, as some crazies do, and look around the dark web, you see that folks are willing to sell all sorts of capabilities, so it's available out there. It is not high-end technology. It is not unavailable. It is not something that they have not aspired to. So why haven't we seen it? What is that tipping point where someone in a terrorist organization will believe that it is in their interest to use offensive capability to be disruptive? And so my message really is, if you understand an adversary that believes that this is capable, that they expressed an intent to use that capability, that that capability exists at a cost, and at not a very high cost, when will we see it in our society? What is that tipping point that someone will use this capability to be disruptive? And if you think about it, if you live in any large city, think about what would happen if you turned the traffic light in any large city, pick your favorite color, red, green, or yellow, it doesn't matter. If everybody believes they either should be stopping or going, think about the, uh, uh, the, the effects of just disrupting traffic in a large city. Think about the effects in the middle of the intense heat on the east coast of the United States where you turn the power off. Think about not just because you will be uncomfortable because it's hot and it's humid, Think about the effects on the electrical power grid across not only the East Coast, but as it spreads across the Midwest, across the Central Plains, et cetera. Think about if you are diabetic and you have to keep your medicine at a certain temperature. Think about all the folks who are uh, diabetic who would then be suffering from health effects because the power is out. Think about the air traffic control system. Think about how, how often it is that we go to a, the, uh, I guess you call it the cash machine, the ATM, and we stick our card in and we put the dollar amount that we expect to get out and the dollar amount comes out? Every, power, every gas station today is connected to the network. We cannot, in, in the United States, I can't find many gas stations where I can actually uh, pump gas to my car without first putting a credit card and some transaction takes place on the internet and someone says, yes, he's paid, go ahead and... So everything that we rely upon, and here's the worst part of this whole story. You thought that was the worst part already. The worst part about it is, we often think about this problem set from a nation state versus nation state. And we think governments will do, figure out how to make, but all of us, are the attack surface, all of us. I usually do this uh, uh, before I start. Show of hands who does not have a smartphone. It's easier to count those. Occasionally there'll be one person, go, I never have a phone. And 
but we either have a phone, we have a watch, we have a device. How many of us think about the fact that there is a, a camera uh, on our television these days, at home, and the television is connected to the network? Why do I need a camera on the television at home? So we are all part of the attack surface. So the problem set isn't about a nation state being nation state, government versus government. It is the vulnerability of the entire enterprise to any sort of attack by an adversary, by a terrorist, by an individual. And so the message for all of us is not just that uh, we're all connected or that Al-Qaeda or ISIS or some other terrorist organization. The question is, what do we do as a collective to prevent that kind of surprise, prevent that kind of operation in the future? I don't know when it will happen, but I know that it will happen. It makes eminent sense. If I was a terrorist, I would find a way to have offensive capability against the most powerful nation state on earth. Any Western country, I would go after them. If I think crazy like that, I guarantee you some very smart, very educated, very capable adversary will in fact think the exact same way, and it isn't when, it isn't if, it's actually when. But we have not seen uh, development of the capability overtly, but it's available. And that really captures uh, what I said uh, on Monday, and I look forward to your questions, and maybe we can think our way through how do we detect, how do we prevent, how do we do collective defense as opposed to individual solving this problem. And look forward to your questions. Thank you. <laughs>